struggle street. Now, to be clear, if you've got low testosterone, that doesn't mean you can't get the results you want. It just makes it so much harder. And testosterone has been plummeting ever since the 1980s. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Now, we've worked with Dr. J, who is an expert in hormones, cholesterol, and genetics. We've worked with several functional doctors, over 160 people. We've crunched the data, and it's in. We can now show you the causes, the signs, and the solutions, natural solutions, to get your game back, to become the man you were born to be. Because why struggle? And there's a multitude of reasons, and it's all driven by metabolic syndrome, and insulin resistance is a big piece of that puzzle. So we're going to walk back insulin resistance. Now, you probably heard me speak about this so many times, but the data's in. Testosterone is being crushed in men. This research paper here, 2000 to 2016, and it's, it's with younger men. We're talking about a cohort, 15 to 19, 20 to 29, and 30 to 39. Now, look at the average here, about 600. It should be way above that for this, for these young men. And over here, 2016, I don't know, let's average it out about there. I don't know, like that's probably... Jeez, is that 500? No, hang on, no, sorry. We're down here about 440, 450. So it's happening. And the biggest problem, as I've learned from these experts, is that it's eventually going to trigger hypogonadism. And quite frankly, the old testes that make the man juice, they shrink. And the exciting news is you can actually walk that back. And... As I mentioned, it's been happening for a very long time. This research paper here from the 1980s, 1.6% per year. Doesn't sound like much, does it? That's a massive 16% per decade. And to make matters worse, free bioavailable to 2 to 3%. And that's what goes into your brain to lower fear and anxiety and what goes into the muscle to build muscle. Now, you can certainly have the bound testosterone do some work, but we want the free stuff. It's going in there. It's free to do whatever it wants, and we want to get that back. Now, this study here, this graph, basically men my age, and I'm 52, 1987 to 89, so I don't know, around about 525 there. And as you can see here, 1990, we're still kicking ass. We weren't obese. We had the energy, but only just. Then 2002, 2004, she's, I don't know, like she's just above the 400 there. And you can imagine what it's like today. That's 2018. We're fat, tight, lazy, and apathetic, apathetic, and people just brushing it off. They don't care. And you might be surprised to learn that there's a lot of research out now that as Huberman said, but also Dr. J, the expert in hormones, men in their 90s, not rare, making as much testosterone and dihydrate testosterone as they were in their 20s. So this is what Dr. J said about that. They got as much testosterone and dihydrate testosterone as they did in their 20s. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. That's true. Yep. It's surprising how little it goes down with age. Yep. If you optimize your health. And so it's possible. And the, the nutritional yeah. advice would. It's possible. Well, you can get it back. It's not a cakewalk. If you're young, six to eight weeks. If you're older, six to 12 months. And that's not what you want to hear, is it? But you can get there. You've got the rest of your life to get this right. It's worth the effort. It's worth the time. Because you don't want to put up with this shit. And before I go through this scientific paper here from Nature, I just want to play a video. This is me and Dr. Amy B. Keelan when I first started unpacking the truth about men with low testosterone. Now, she's an MD doctor and an expert in sexual performance and longevity. And what she said to me when I spoke to her about this issue floored me. Listen to this. All right, that's right. 
also mm-hmm. things that are even more important. You know, we know that men who have lower testosterone levels, they tend to have higher mortality rates in general. So all cause mortality is higher in men with the lowest quartile of testosterone levels. Um, so we're going to see increases in things like cardiovascular disease, so heart attacks, strokes are going to go up generally if you have low testosterone, increased diabetes, increased obesity, um, you know, increased uh, problems with mood disorders, depression, insomnia, anxiety, all of that goes up as you have lower testosterone levels. And then certainly sexual dysfunction. So everything from low libido to low sperm counts and infertility are all associated with low testosterone. So it's not something that we should just brush off as being like, ah, it's no big deal. Like it's kind of a big deal. It actually means that our men are getting less and less healthy and they're more and more likely to suffer from some kind of disease uh, problem. So it's nothing, not something that we should brush off. I mean, look at your mood. It really turns to shit here, doesn't it? And all of this. And this is what Dr. Ken Berry said to me about the signs and symptoms of low testosterone. But uh, just focusing on low testosterone, yeah, the, the classic symptoms are fatigue, no get up and go, no drive, no, no drive anywhere, no drive in, at the office. No drive, uh, you know, in the in the yard or the garden. No drive in the bedroom. Just you don't really care about doing a good job at anything. You just kind of you get you 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 get by to to get along. Uh, weight gain is very common. Uh, you you're you're tired all the time, yet you don't really sleep very deeply during the night. Uh, belly fat is is a huge. Even if you're not overweight, you're still going to have a little belly pooch. It's very yeah, classic. Yeah. You can start to um, develop man boobs, uh, which I, I have a YouTube video. You know that video? Is, that was me, yeah. Two million views or something because it, having man boobs is so common in the world today that there are over two million men who've watched my video on YouTube about it, if not three. All those things are symptoms of low testosterone, and there's a long list of prescription medications that you might be taking from your doctor, you know, your doctor that you trust, that could actually be plummeting your testosterone levels. I've got to talk more about that as we progress. And I'll show you the big problem that we've discovered working with these functional doctors. But uh, let's have a look at this research paper from Nature here. Look at the headline, sexual and non-sexual symptoms, testosterone deficiency negatively affect quality of life considerable general health concerns well if you've got a big game to play i don't know how fucking general they are they seem like a big deal to me what do you think drop a comment below what do you think decreased energy vitality well-being and motivation diminished physical and work performance decreased mood feeling sad and blue impaired cognition increased sleepiness and fatigue poor concentration and memory is how how is that going to help you getting the life that you want you know, it goes on. Waist circumference gets larger. As Dr. Ken said there, you, you mightn't be overweight, but you just can't get the abs. Then you've got the worst thing of all, reduced testes. So the factories that make your man juice, that make your testosterone, they shrink. And the beautiful and exciting news is you can walk that back. You've also got reduced beard growth and hair, man boobs, gynecomastia, the workbench in the bedroom, you don't feel like the man you are, you're supposed to be. Then over here, reduced muscle bulk and strength. You know, it's a mess. So what's the likelihood of you getting what you want from life? And that's sure, it's still possible, but it just makes it harder. So why suffer? Why put up with this shit? So what Dr. J said to me is that, you know, being here is great, but you don't have to get that high. And I'll talk about how high towards the end and the safe zone, as far as Dr. J is concerned, is 500 and above. We've seen men even do pretty good with 450, but nothing below that. So that's kind of the gray zone under the 500 there. And then if you're here, big problem, better fix it immediately. So what we're going to talk about, supplementation, do they really work? Can they help? We'll talk about that towards the end. And we'll also talk about the testosterone pathway cleanse, what we need to do there. And as I said there, if you're a younger gentleman, six to eight weeks, you can double low testosterone. So this is one of the dudes that we helped. Uh, so my testosterone went from uh, 
I think it was 338 to uh, three, I'm sorry, 637. So almost 300 points. 300 points, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good result. And that was what, six or eight weeks? I believe that was six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. Well, let's call it eight. So kind of low testosterone and well over the 500 there, which is pretty damn good. So the biggest problem that we see in all the blood labs that we've done and multiple blood labs with, with individuals is insulin resistance, which drives metabolic syndrome. I'll come back to that. But the big problem with insulin resistance is it's really tough to drop the body fat and pack on the muscle. Because number one, over here, insulin resistance associated with a decrease in Lydig cell testosterone secretion. The dig cells are cells inside the testes there. So you're not making a lot of testosterone, but to make matters worse, insulin is in the up position. It's a bit too high. So you've got an upregulation of aromatase, inappropriate upregulation of aromatase. And there's 17 accelerators of that, which we can we need to take off the table. In a nutshell, all your androgens, we're talking about testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, which is 10 times more potent than testosterone. So it's another androgen your body makes. And the weaker one, DHEA, all right? So they go through this aromatization here, there, and turns into oestrogen. So you've got low T anyway, and then you what little T you've got left in dihydro and DHEA goes through there and that's what happens. You feel like shit, your energy's up and down all over the place and you're experiencing all of those symptoms which we just went over. So why put up with that? Again, what do you want? What's the likelihood, time delay and effort and sacrifice? It just makes everything harder, clearly. So this is insulin resistance metabolic syndrome. I'm about to play a video for you from Dr. Mark Heyman, functional doctor. Listen to this. We know clearly that pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, many of the common cancers, pancreatic cancer, are caused by something called insulin resistance, which is pre-diabetes or poor metabolic health. 93.2% of Americans are in poor metabolic health, meaning they have some form of pre-diabetes or insulin resistance. They have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they're overweight, or they've had a heart attack or stroke. And that poor metabolic health is driving all these conditions, whether it's cancer, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, depression, infertility, so many different things, even acne. The, our, our food system. Right, so metabolic syndrome there. So basically it's, it's driving a lot of pathologies. Remember what Dr. Ken Berry said about big pharma drugs? They bring down testosterone and they keep it down. So we're talking about these pathologies. We're talking hypertension, atherosclerosis, cardiomyopathy, enlarged heart. Your fat cells are leaching pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is shutting down testosterone. Then you've got lipotoxicity, glucose intolerance in the muscles, which will lead to full-blown type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, liver disease, and the worst thing I believe that can happen is your central nervous system starts to tap out. So dementia, cognitive decline. And then as Dr. Mark said, cancer, breast, uterus, cervix, colon, esophagus, pancreas, kidney, prostate, along with chronic kidney disease. And if you're a lady, polycystic ovary syndrome. So this is another research paper speaking to metabolic syndrome. And the main driver of that is insulin resistance, as you see over here. Upregulation in the aromatization of testosterone. So you've got low T anyway, and this sparks up. So it's accelerating the conversion of T into E. And it promotes all of these pathways to upregulate. And I'll talk more about this and how to solve this problem in this video here. You got superoxide and perinitrite here, which is called the devil's triangle. So you want to take that off the table. I want to show you how to do that here today. As you can see, though, enlarged prostate, frequent urination, gynecomastia, man boobs, obesity, atherosclerosis through vasodilation and dyslipidemia, 
hypertension, type 2, insulin resistance, erectile dysfunction, and it's driving a lot of cancer. But let's just have a look at the central nervous system and brain. How is it impacted? More research. So, we, you know, we, we want to fix this problem. Insulin resistance causes oxidative stress in your moneymaker, your brain over here, Alzheimer's, cognitive impairment, cerebral degradation. So this is a now 82-year-old brain. It's typical, right? It's diseased. Quite literally, the cortex is rotting away. Cere cerebral degradation, cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. Are you going to put up with that? Are you happy with that? We need to fix this problem. So here are, based on all the blood work we've done with functional doctors, over 160 people now, multiple blood panels, that's the drivers, all of these drivers here. So we're going to start systematically trying to take these off the table. So I'm going to start providing the solutions as we progress. But as you can see here, low testosterone is driving metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, erectile dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction. So you don't have a lot of nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is a powerhouse for boosting testosterone and a vasodilator for great blood pressure. You've got less adiponectin, which is a powerful fat loss hormone. You've got more inflammation than you care to have, which is tanking your testosterone and your muscle growth. Then you've got adipokine, so you're packing on the fat, and adipose tissue activation, not cool. So if you want to pack on the muscle and drop the body fat, this is how it all works out, and I've done another video about that. Should be linked below. But basically, legends, you need your V8 hormones in the up position consistently, and these sons of bitches here, they're too high. They're dysregulated. They're out of balance, which is crushing your testosterone. And as I mentioned, chronic low testosterone atrophies the testes, and you don't want that to happen. So... We know that low testosterone can cause it and also low muscle mass. What you might know is that gut health is absolutely huge. So the next three slides are going to blow your mind, especially about the system. So working with a lot of people, we've identified if we do their genetics, if we get everything on point, there's still a problem if they're not dropping the body fat as quickly as we hoped. Because we know that you should be dropping the body fat pretty quickly. And the reason is very simple. you still got a sick gut. And the unfortunate truth about a sick gut is it can take two to three months to heal. So listen to this. Because of the insulin resistance that's created in your gut biome, yep. um, metabolic stress and the inflammation that's created there, he says, yeah, he says the glutamide might not be doing anything for you or very little. So after we spoke to a functional doctor and he looked at his gut, we worked out that that was causing insulin resistance and inflammation. So he had a sick gut. Now he's well on the road to recovery. So you can heal a sick gut, but guess what else happens when you've got a sick gut? So I'm about to play a video for you from Dr. Dadassi really smart dude, PhD, DHSC, DC, MS, MMSC, FACN. Holy shit. And listen to this. So inflammation in the gut uh, activates uh, gut immune cells. Those gut immune cells send messenger proteins to cells in the brain called neuroglia. Those neuroglia get activated and then the brain gets inflamed. And when the brain gets inflamed, nerve conduction synapses slow down, inflammation in the brain slows down synapses, and, and patients just can't think, they can't focus, they can't get their thought process going on. So those are the things that happen with it. So basically, some people that, that have immune reactions to gluten, um, they get severe brain inflammation, when they eat it, they can even have their blood-brain barrier, gut barrier breakdown. They can set up the stage for neurological autoimmunity. They can decrease blood flow to their brain. As their brain gets inflamed, their messenger synaptic pathways become slower, and they just don't function well. And they walk in the healthcare system, and they get diagnosed with chronic depressive disorder or chronic anxiety disorder or some other name. And... Uh,
Did you catch all that? So your money maker doesn't work too well. You feel like an idiot and a lazy loser. You can't learn properly. You've got brain fog. You're up and down all over the place. Now, big food is a big piece of the problem because they put emulsifiers in your food that wash away the protective lining of the gut. You've got gut dysbiosis. You've got inflammation, preservatives and chemical. It's a nuclear bomb going off inside your gut. So you've got microbiota changing their composition, which isn't good. I mean, the protective layer is destroyed. You've got intestinal permeability, bacteria, translocation into the bloodstream. So you get viruses and bacterial infections, sinusitis, low-grade inflammation, glucose intolerance. So there goes your insulin resistance. It goes to shit. And you, got, you run the risk of irritable bowel disease. And then... Irritable bowel disease and gut problems has been heavily linked to anxiety and depression-like behavior and neuroinflammation. Psychological stress, as we just mentioned, anxiety and depression, aggravates colitis, activates the HPA axis, so cortisol goes up, and it completely makes you feel like shit. Then what happens? This is what happens. Listen. All those things are symptoms of low testosterone. And there's a long list of prescription medications that you might be taking from your doctor, you know, your doctor that you trust, that could actually be plummeting your testosterone levels. So you go there to get the anxiety and depression cure and it brings down your testosterone. You know what the most powerful thing is to take care of anxiety? Optimal testosterone, namely free tea. Free tea goes in the brain and it lowers fear and anxiety, gives you motivation, courage, and confidence. So why don't they optimize for testosterone instead of pre prescribing these drugs? Well, Dr. J might have some insights to that. Listen to what Dr. J said to me about how powerful testosterone is at lowering inflammation in the entire body. Listen carefully. Discs in the back, it goes back to testosterone. It probably has some low back stuff. But this plus plus in the sheet, almost everybody complains of low back pain and things. Yep. Um, but it's all about testosterone to keep that at bay to protect against future problems there. Testosterone, yep. testosterone. How, testosterone. How does testosterone do that? It shuts off interleukins. And interleukins kind of like CRP, it's a form of inflammation. Right. Okay. And there's 24 of them. There's IL-1, there's IL-2, there's IL-3, all the way to 24. And some of them are in your knees and some are in your elbows and some are in your discs and your back and some are in your right. brain. Yeah. And so like this particular one, IL-1-alpha, it's called interleukin-1-alpha. It's in your discs in your low back. Yep. And it can get out of hand and just cause specific low back disc degeneration and disc pain and bulging discs and all this kind of stuff. If you have inflammation there all the time and testosterone shuts it off. So I guess testosterone would be a very powerful lever to pull down on to get rid of inflammation when it's up at the right yep. level. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. In general, yep. especially in the low back. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> That's why the drug companies hate it, right? Because if you have nice high <laughs> testosterone, it's going to heal a lot of chronic issues that they they're prescribing drugs for like arthritis and gut issues, like IBS. They have all these drugs for irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. It's just like on yeah. and on. Testosterone is like a magic trick to bring down mm -hmm. inflammation all over the body. Exactly. exactly. So yeah. as we see there, they're prescribing drugs for all of those things, including anxiety and depression. So what we do when we're working with functional doctors, we do a neurotransmitter check to make sure serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, glutamine, 5-HTP, histamine, all of those are in the right direction. So... That's one of the things that is the difference with functional medicine there. Now, another big problem is mental stress because when you're under mental stress, you produce a lot of cortisol and glucocorticoids, cortisol, guess what it does? It'll shut down testosterone production. But as I mentioned previously, it takes all your androgens, again, testosterone dihydro, testosterone DHEA, through this aromatization into estrogen. So you've got low T and you're wasting what little you've got left turning to estrogen, you feel like shit, All right? And that can lead to insulin resistance. So mental stress by itself can trigger insulin resistance if it's chronic 
long, you know, long-term mental stress. So you got to make sure that you got a strong fucking mindset. You got to have that coach inside your head telling you you can fucking win. That's the bottom line. Next port of call is sleep. So there's a lot of research behind this. It's kind of the foundation. You basically reset yourself for the next day so you can attack the day, seize the day. You know, sleep is absolutely huge. So when you don't get sleep or you even paradoxically get too much sleep, it's associated with lower insulin sensitivity. So a pretty big problem. Now, if you want to get lean and muscular, again, sleep to the rescue. I'll play a video for you from Dr. Matthew Walker, sleep neuroscientist, talking about how important sleep is. Not getting sufficient sleep, 70% of all the weight that you lose will come from lean muscle mass, sorry, and not fat. Right, the body, when it's fatigued in that way, wants to hold on to those fats. Exactly. Right? Your body becomes stingy in giving up its fat. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when you are underslept, but you're trying to watch your diet, watch what you eat, you will lose what you wanted to keep, which is muscle, and you will gain what you wanted to lose, which is fat. Yeah, you lose muscle, gain fat, tired. So one of the biggest drivers of poor sleep is insulin resistance. Now, how does that play out? Well, let's have a look. So you've got two stress systems, the fast path. So really quickly, stress hormones released from the adrenals. And that causes an increased heart rate, blood pressure, and converts glycogen into glucose. Glucose goes into the bloodstream while you're sleeping, which isn't a good thing, which lowers growth hormone while you're sleeping. Then you've got your alert, right? So you wake up. Now that happens. Then that triggers the slow path in about three minutes, which means cortisol goes up. Interesting thing about cortisol, it's got a 15 minute half-life, which means it takes a full 30 minutes to metabolize the cortisol to get it back down to healthy levels. And guess how the body gets rid of that excess? Toilet. You wake up to go to the toilet through the urine, right? So that's why stress will wake you up. It'll make you alert, increase your blood pressure, dump a whole bunch of glucose in the bloodstream. Then you've got this shit here, vasoconstriction. You wake up, you go to the toilet. So that's how insulin resistance can really shortchange your sleep. So we've covered so far gut health and poor sleep. And you know, just so you know, this is what we've got to fix to have deep restorative sleep, to wake up the next morning to seize the day. If you want to know more information about that and how to do that, drop a comment below and I'm happy to do another video all about that. So personal carbohydrate threshold. So this is where your genetics heavily, heavily plays in. So this, this person's genetics here got a really poor glucose tolerance. Doesn't can't tolerate a lot of glucose, you know, different transporters. But this legend here, super, you know, can have lots and lots of carbohydrates. So basically, in a nutshell, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with glucose, but here's the three main things. Number one, you can turn it into energy in the form of ATP. And the second thing you can do is use that energy to make fat or build muscle. Now, if you've got insulin resistance, you're biased to making more fat. So that's why we've got to fix insulin resistance. And the third thing, you can park it in the muscle as glycogen and the liver as glycogen. So if you want to know more information about how to eat and work out your personal carbohydrate threshold, if you want to know more information about that, which is huge, drop a comment below. I'm more than happy to provide another video on how to do that. Now let's talk about the next three. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, the omega-3s, and mental stress. So we've, we've already touched on mental stress. It can cause insulin resistance. So you've got to have a strong mindset, legends. All right, and I used to have panic attacks, performance anxiety. I know what it's like to feel like a weak man. And you can walk that back. You can have a strong mindset. And you know what helps a lot? V8 hormones. That's what helps. 
Got to get them back in the up position, but also consistently keep them there. So these endocrine disrupting chemicals produce insulin resistance all by themselves. And when you've got way too much omega-6 and very little omega-3, you've got a high omega-6 index. So you've got leptin resistance, so you're hungry all the time, and you've got insulin resistance. So what we need to do, and this reverses itself over about 12 weeks, you need to get a test to find out where you are. And with all the people that we've helped, we've checked their omega index, and it's normally in the red to orange zone there. So they've got insulin resistance and they're always hungry. Big problem. So over 12 weeks, you can get it in the green and you take that Trojan horse off the table. But as an added bonus, there's a lot of research coming out now, multiple studies where it increases the rate of protein synthesis. Here's just two. So you're packing on more muscle. So I'll just play this video right here from Dr. Chris McGlory here, PhD. You know, he's a leading researcher on the omega-3s. Listen. Smith, we found that in the omega-3 group, there was higher rates of protein synthesis, in it, uh, which, would, which would kind of, again, corroborate the mechanisms of action of omega-3s, which is to enhance the protein synthetic response to daily protein feeding. So I'm going to talk about how we can start to solve this problem in a few slides out from here, all right? And which is, which is absolutely huge. But the next port of call is iron overload. So there's a lot of people out there that do have iron overload. We've worked with a lot of people now. We've checked their blood labs. And here's the problem. This, this, this is another big problem. You've got standard labs and then you've got optimal labs. Now, standard labs will say 30 to 400 for ferritin here. Now, you need to get a more comprehensive iron panel done than ferritin. This is a great first step. I'll say that 400 is okay. No, we need to get it between 50 and 100 for ferritin, especially if you're like me and you've got a hemochromatosis risk because iron overload right here, the hemochromatosis, impotence was correlated with a 50% reduction in plasma testosterone, resulting in 63% decrease in testosterone production and testicular atrophy. So how do you solve this problem? Simple. Donate blood. So that's what this next part of the study is here. Number two, insulin resistance was markedly improved after depletion of iron stores. Donate blood. Pretty simple. But it's not just affecting the testes and testosterone. It's affecting everything. Everything. Listen to this. Iron is referred to non-transferrin-bound iron. And when this happens, cells will take up this non-transferrin-bound iron into the liver, for example, the heart, the pituitary glands, the joints, the pancreas, as well as the gonads. And here, they undergo biochemical reactions, which creates reactive oxygen species, which in turn causes tissue damage, inflammation, and fibrosis. So, for example, in the liver, it can cause cirrhosis. As well, it increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. In the heart, it can cause restrictive or dilated cardiomyopathy as well as arrhythmia. In the joints, it causes arthritis. In the pituitary glands, when you have iron depositing here, it can cause secondary hypothyroidism or secondary hypogonadism. In the pancreas, the deposition of iron can cause diabetes mellitus. In the gonads, it can, obviously, it can cause testicular atrophy, amongst many other things. So basically, you're going to develop a lot of pathologies and then be put on big pharma drugs. So you really want to check your iron stores there. If you want any more information about that, drop a comment below. I'm more than happy to do a deep dive into that. Now, the next piece of the puzzle is big food, all right? So big food, unfortunately, it's devoid of nutrients. It's packed full of chemicals, preservatives, emulsifiers, and all of that shit, which completely destroys your gut, 
can give you inflammation and to make matters worse, a lot of this shit food here is packed full of advanced glycation and lip oxidization end products in food. And another big problem is that it can cause, start to cause all of these issues, pathologies, atherosclerosis, oxidative stress, lipid peroxidization. Then you've got arthritis, pulmonary disorders like asthma and allergies, airway issues, endocrine disorders. So it's disrupting your hormones, testosterone, all of them. Then number five, 50 times more free radicals. So pretty shit. Now, the, the pesticides in the food, <clears throat> lots of research behind this now, they completely screw up testosterone production and cause a lot of oxidative stress. So big food is big toxic and it's nutrient devoid. And listen to what Dr. J has got to say about that. So the pharma companies are very, they're very excited about keeping your testosterone down from a financial perspective. Exactly. As a business, as a business model, it's a good idea for them. So it's like big food make you sick pathologies and big pharma come along because you believe you've got no other option to solve that all of those pathologies. But now we know different, we can actually walk that back. And so we've covered all of these, these nine things we're going to take these off the table. Now, the next one is liver health and nutrient status. So I'm going to put these two together because this is absolutely huge. So the liver detoxes pollutants, contaminants, chemicals, drugs, big pharma drugs, alcohol, food additives and preservatives, metabolic end products and microorganisms. Wow. So you've got phase one and phase two liver detox, and this needs to be working supremely efficiently at a very high capacity. And you need lots of fat-soluble vitamins, antioxidant, B vitamins, glutathione, sunshine helps with phase one. Then phase two, you need adequate proteins like glutamine, cysteine, glycine, lysine, taurine, magnesium, B vitamins. Now, I'm just going to focus in on one mineral, magnesium here. So magnesium is needed to have supreme liver function and the research behind it there now so if you got low magnesium the body sounds the alarm your neurocytes here release this thing called substance p goes into the bone a whole bunch of white blood cells come out and called leukocytes here hepatic liver injury by just not having enough magnesium that one thing alone and I just want to talk a little bit more about magnesium because it is huge. If you have low magnesium, you've also got insulin resistance and you've also got low energy. The reason is very simple, as Dr. James Don Nicolantonio says, so you need magnesium to activate ATP. So your cells make ATP, the energy currency of the cells, and the way that it activates ATP, you've got adenosine, the A, and three phosphates, one, two, three, triphosphate. So magnesium here comes in and cleaves off one of those phosphates. And just like this match produces energy, you produce energy. If you have inadequate magnesium, your body's not stupid. It'll store it as fat for a rainy day instead of having energy. And you've also got insulin resistance. And to make matters worse, you need adequate magnesium to have bioavailable free tea. And look what else magnesium does, but it also does 300 other mission critical jobs in your amazing body. It's needed to make testosterone energy production, muscle function, nerve operations, antioxidant defenses, as we just saw, DNA and RNA repair and synthesis. Think about that. If you don't have enough magnesium, you're not repairing your DNA. Electrolyte balance, heart health, maintain rhythm and blood pressure, protein synthesis, glucose and insulin regulation. So you can see how this plays into insulin resistance. Neurotransmitter release, right? Releasing your neurotransmitters 
mood regulation, immune support, and learning and memory for your moneymaker. Absolutely huge. At the beginning of this presentation here, I talked about insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Remember I talked about superoxide and perinitrite here and nitric oxide, right? Let's put this together. This is called the devil's triangle, and this is huge. So basically, all of our cells use, use oxygen. So when we breathe, oxygen goes into the cell, into the mitochondria. So the mitochondria create the ATP, energy of the cell. And when we breathe, it creates superoxide. So the oxygen turns into superoxide. Now, the body's amazing. It's got this enzyme called superoxide dismutase, right? So it will take that superoxide and turn it into hydrogen peroxide, but it's still toxic. You don't want hydrogen peroxide to build up, do we? No, so this is where glutathione comes along, right? The liver, glutathione, and turns it into H2O, harmless water. So what happens if you don't have enough manganese? Manganese binds to superoxide dismutase so it can actually work. So if you have low levels, of manganese, that superoxide here stays as superoxide. And back up here, superoxide binds to nitric oxide and produces perinitrite here, which causes lipid peroxidization, protein oxidization, protein nitration, and it inactivates enzymes, holy shit, which causes necrosis, tissue damage, and apoptosis, cell death. So you want to make sure you've got adequate manganese, and I'll show you how to do that very shortly. But we're not done yet. In the cytosol and in the extracellular membrane there, you need copper and zinc at the right ratios to power up the other two forms of superoxide dismutase here. So let's have a look at this, and I'll show you the solution very shortly. But I just want to show to you how bad oxidative stress is right here. This oxidative stress and the large majority is triggered by superoxide here. This is Dr. Amy B. Keelan just speaking about erectile dysfunction and oxidative stress and inflammation. Listen. These cells within the penis, these smooth muscle cells begin to die. This is called apoptosis. Um, apoptosis happens for a number of reasons, but once you lose about 15% of the cells within here, all of a sudden you lose the ability to expand completely. You can still expand and you can still have an erection, but it's not a full erection. And so when that happens, you've got your, you've got your tunica, but those veins are staying open. So the blood comes in, but the, and the blood then goes right back out of these open veins because you, have, you haven't expanded fully and you don't have a full erection. Does that make sense? So this is called venous leak, CBOD, but it's not a vein problem. It's actually a problem with the cells inside the, the corpora cavernosa. These cells, these smooth muscle cells are the problem. Now, what causes these cells to die? Oxidative stress of some sort. So things that cause inflammation and oxidative stress can increase the, the death of these cells. So that could be just age, but it also could be poor lifestyle choices. It could be diabetes or high blood pressure. It could be a high sugar diet. It could be not exercising. Also low testosterone over time can do that. So anything that causes these cells. Catch all that. So that oxidative stress is pretty bad. Before I show you the solution, I just want to show you this slide again. Big food, 50 times more free radicals, oxidative stress, right? Big food and it's nutrient devoid. So back here, so this oxidative stress is causing necrosis, tissue damage to all of our tissues, lipid peroxidization, you got inflammation, DNA damage, depletion of all the antioxidant systems, decrease in hormone production, right? You see the theme here, the damage of DNA and reproductive dysfunction and infertility. So right here, this is the devil's triangle, as you can see, devil's triangle, nitric oxide binds to superoxide, perinitrate, and that's the devil's triangle. So we need superoxide dismutase. So you've got superoxide dismutase one, two, and three, and two of them use copper and zinc at the right ratios, and the other one uses manganese. So let's have a look here. This is 
Dr. Chris Masterjohn, PhD, nutritional scientist. So copper, we're going to get a lot of copper from things like liver, oysters, mushrooms, and pure chocolate and spirulina. So if you're getting a few of those foods, you should be pretty safe, right? Then zinc, as Chris Masterjohn says here, we're going to get zinc from oysters, red meat, cheese, and do you see anything about vegetables there? There's, you know, there's kind of not a lot there, but they, there are, there is zinc in a lot of vegetables there, but there's a thing called phthalates that can inhibit the absorption of zinc. So phthalates are found in whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes. So what he also mentions is that if you soak them, sprout them, or use fermentation, it gets rid of a lot of these phthalates. So I'm not saying not to eat those foods. I'm saying you just want to be very intelligent about how you're eating those foods, if that makes sense. Now, let's talk about this other thing called manganese here, right? It binds to superoxide. So if you recall over here, you've got superoxide dismutase, a manganese acts as a cofactor on superoxide dismutase to take care of superoxide there. So there's a lot of manganese in ginger. So a little bit of ginger can get about 96% of your RDI. And this information from the scientific literature speaks volumes about how powerful ginger is. And I use ginger every single day. Antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-obesity. So it's inhibiting adipogenesis, the accumulation of fat. Anti-nausea, cardiovascular protection, respiratory protection, neuroprotection, brain protection, and anti-diabetics. So increases insulin sensitivity. Holy shit. Reducing plasma glucose, really powerful. Anti-cancer, antimicrobial. And now we're not done with ginger yet. So this is how you produce testosterone inside the Ludig cells in your testes. And I'm just going to focus in on this pathway here. So you see CGMP right there. That's the nitric oxide pathway. So nitric oxide, cyclic guanosine monophosphate here. So I'll just get rid of this here. So CGMP there. This pathway has been found to play a major role in male sexual function, inducing the production of NO, known as a potent vasodilator. So this study here concluded that 6-gingerol is a potent bioactive compound in ginger is able to stimulate this here, CGMP, to enhance nitric oxide production. Now think about it. It's got manganese in it, so it's taking care of business on so many levels and it's doing everything you see on screen there. It's taking care of this devil's triangle. Makes sense? But again, you also need optimal copper and zinc. And I've outlined where you can get copper and you can get zinc there. But you've got to get it at the right ratios. But if you follow those foods, you should be pretty safe. So if you like the, this information that I'm putting out there, legends, drop a comment below and share this so more people can learn this information. This is what I learned from the functional doctors and also Dr. J. And this is what I also learned from Dr. J right here. And this comes from this legend here. So he works as a consultant for leading agricultural and food companies. And ever since the 1940s, look what's happened to our food. It's been completely depleted in vitamins and minerals. And as he's now found, we need approximately two times more meat, three times more fruit, and four to, four to five times more vegetables to have the same amount as our grandfathers did back in the 1940s. And in the 1940s, I mean, my age had over double the testosterone they do today. And they weren't exposed to chemicals. They were outside in the sun. They were getting things done. They had a strong mindset. They didn't have to contend with the bullshit that we have to contend with today in this toxic modern world that we live in. Does that connect the dots? Can you see how this has played out? over the last 80 plus years. Yeah, I find that fascinating. Now, a couple of things. I'm going to play this video from Dr. Ken Berry, then I'm going to unpack it. The untrue story that eating a slave diet is the healthiest diet for a human mm. being. 
eating a plant-based diet, that's that's exactly the diet that the Roman emperors fed their subjects to keep yeah. them from revolting. It, that they they had a full belly, they didn't starve to death, but they had no motivation. They had they had no mental inquisitiveness or ingenuity, and so they were easy easy to keep down. So the system tells us to eat all these very low density foods, and plus the salt's deleted any depleted anyway. Right, like even chicken is not very good. I don't eat a lot of chicken, and if I do, it's it's always the dark meat. There's more nutrients in the dark meat, and they tell us to avoid all of these things here. Right, all of these foods very high in nutrient density. They tell us to avoid those. Now, if you cast your mind back to the liver, look at what it needs: adequate proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Holy shit! And if you have a look at this here, are you getting enough manganese? Are you getting enough copper and zinc based on their recommendations? Or is this, is, is this what's happening to you? You've got a lot of oxidative stress, DNA damage, lipid peroxidization, decreasing hormone production, reproductive dysfunction, infertility, because you're eating a lot of this shit. It's got pesticides in it that destroy your testes. I mean, can you see what's going on here, legends? It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? All right. So if you like this video, drop a comment below, share it, and you know, ask questions, get involved here. Let's reach more people with this. So what we've covered now is all of this, liver health and nutrient status. Now we're going to talk about circadian misalignment, and it simply means Morning sun, a little bit of UVB, don't get burnt, and afternoon sun. We're supposed to be out there like our grandfathers in the 1940s because, look on screen here, this has been shown now over and over again, but the system does not tell us to do this. If you don't get the morning and afternoon sun and a little bit of UV, this is what happens to us. Our cells are linked to the sun. They're like a switch to switch us on. So emotional responses, fluctuations in mood, irritability, anxiety, loss of empathy, frustration, negative salience. So you've got more negative thoughts than you care to have. Then you've got acute impacts in cognitive responses. So impairments in cognitive performance, memory consolidation, attention, concentration, communication, decision-making, creativity and productivity, and mode performance to perform at the gym, and do cardio and long-term health consequences, daytime sleepiness, micro sleeps at the wheel, cardiovascular disease, altered stress response, which means more stress. Then you've got infection, lowered immunity, cancer, me metabolic abnormalities, and diabetes, depression, and psychosis. Wow, and they don't tell us to do this. Now, according to Huberman, if it's sunny in the morning, within 30 minutes to an hour, give 10 minutes to 15 minutes if it's bright. If it's overcast, you'll need close to 30 minutes. And you can also use light therapy at about 30 minutes. If you want more information, drop a comment below and I'll do a video all about this. And we're not done yet because when you get the morning sun, it optimizes healthy cortisol and also DHEA. So DHEA is a weak androgen and it can be turned into testosterone. So you want to be making more cortisol or you want to be making more DHEA. It really is that simple. The next thing that happens when the light here from the sun hits the retina, so you don't want to look directly at the sun, of course, you don't want to do that, but it goes down this pathway to the thyroid hormone and stimulates Thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroid hormone revs up your metabolism, testosterone, muscle growth, protein synthesis, fat loss, your energy, all of it. So as you can see there, win the morning, get out in the sun, but you're also going to do one more thing that's super important, especially if you want to walk back into your resistance. So the way that the body gets glucose out of the bloodstream so we can park it in the liver or the muscles, use it for energy and or use it to build muscle, not fat, is to have transporters on the cells. They're called glute transporters. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them. So guess what? Thyroid hormone puts more transporters on the muscle cells, 
right? And so does testosterone here. Testosterone puts more transporters. So the better testosterone, the better thyroid, the more efficiently that you'll have glucose and you'll bring down insulin. And one more thing. So number one, thyroid. Number two, optimal testosterone. Number three, exercise. So when you exercise, those transporters pop up onto the cells, takes the glucose out of the bloodstream, puts it in the muscle, and you use it for energy, right? So get out in the morning sun, do 10 to 15 minutes of exercise as a minimum, and you're setting yourself up for a great day, great energy. And... They've shown in multiple studies now that if you get under 4,000 steps per day, testosterone, nanograms per deciliter here, about 400. But if you get 12,000 plus, she's up here, about 600, right? So we've got to, we're physical beasts, right? We've got to get out in the morning sun. We've got to exercise. We've got to be like our grandfathers back in the 40s. We've got to have adequate vitamin and mineral states. We've got to have a strong mindset. And then we can become the, the men and the women that we were born to be. We can build a life that we're proud of. And this is how it's done. So we do not want low testosterone. And you can see here now that all of these 14 things, when we take them off the table by making smarter choices about what we put in our body, filling in the voids where we are lacking vitamins and minerals, and we get out in the sun, we exercise, we've got a strong mindset. What's stopping us? What's stopping us? Well, all this bullshit has been happening for a very long time. Now, as I mentioned there at the beginning of this, like these are the supplements, and I'm not going to go through them now, that have been shown in clinical trials to boost testosterone. And I want to focus on just one at the moment, because I hear, hear a lot of gurus out there saying to get this one into you, which is apigenin. As you can see, a significant down regulation, the expression of all these genes and enzymes in the testosterone pathway there. So as you can see here, apigenin decreases T. So testosterone, all these enzymes and pathways here, just slowing it down. So you've got to be very careful about what you put in your body if you want to optimize testosterone. If you want more information about that, drop a comment below and I'm happy to do another video about what we've discovered working with functional doctors, Dr. J, to optimize testosterone pathway. This is what I call the testosterone pathway cleanse. Testosterone pathway cleanse. Now, just to touch on genetics a little bit, it's a, it's a big problem because if you've got a sensitivity to nightshades like I have, this is what can happen. Listen carefully. With fatigue, you know, you want to know what's causing fatigue. Here it is. Yeah, nightshades are definitely contributing. Right, so these nightshades, yeah, definitely contributing, but also the anxiety with the caffeine. Yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot of things. I mean, he's got the thyroid, which contributes to fatigue. He's got those estrogen genes. Yeah. He's got the vitamin D genes. They're definitely linked to fatigue. He's got the gluten sensitivity. He's got the CRP, which is, I mean, it's all, there's a lot of targets here and he's got to dial them all in intermittent fast. And this is where caffeine actually comes back up because this gene, yeah, it's involved in, it's, see, caffeine doesn't just, doesn't just break down with one single process in your body mm -hmm. there's multiple enzymes that are involved in breaking it down so a little bit of it gets broken down and then it gets to, goes down the line and then it gets broken out a little bit more and then it goes yeah. down the line and gets and this is on that assembly line where that's involved in breaking down caffeine bche yep so caffeine stays in his body longer because of this gene right so therefore it could trigger more anxiety okay and same with pepper and some other things that are kind of unusual, like hooperzine or something. Like some people take hooperzine as a supplement. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, but the most important thing is nightshades. I would avoid nightshades. the tomatoes and the peppers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I guess. All right. So as you can see there, nightshades, pretty big deal. And that includes organophosphates. Where do you get organophosphates from? Non-organic vegetables and fruits lots of organophosphates in there so that could be you and we we see close to 30 percent with the nightshade gene over 160 people then about 65 percent with the lectin 
sensitivity. Listen to lectin sensitivity. Pretty serious. The lectin is a big one. That's a fourfold higher risk of heart disease, even as a plus minus, the S E L E. Yeah, that's um, huge. Yeah. Yeah. So lectins are going to trigger a lot of damage to the arteries and damage to the gut. I would recommend avoiding grains, yeah. you know? Grains, grains are the, yeah. the major source of lectins. Yeah. And his gut's very sensitive to grains also with the gluten. And, he, and he's got a thyroid gene that comes up later with gluten as well. So I would say just take off the grains. You know? So lectins are going to damage the heart and arteries, but also the gut. And remember at the beginning of this about gut health, it can trigger anxiety and depression-like behavior. Cortisol, it's going to increase insulin resistance, all of that. So you've got to be very careful about what you put in your body. Not everyone is sensitive to lectins. My wife is, my kids are, but I'm not. But I'm, I'm sensitive to nightshades and organophosphates. And I'm also sensitive to oxalates and a few things like that. But then you've also got things like a slow testosterone gene there. So you, if, if you've got those genes, are you sentenced to low testosterone? No. With the, probably, I'd say about 25% of the people we work with have that low testosterone gene, including me. And we've had to work super hard, especially myself, to get testosterone optimized. So you can fix these issues. And don't forget, forget about the iron overload there, because as you can see, it is huge. It's basically going to crush all of your organs and systems over time. So another thing that you want to be very careful about is the difference between standard labs and optimal labs. So one gentleman that we worked with closely with Dr. J and functional doctors, we were able to reverse a blood disorder. Listen. Uh, like everything is looking great. Like my platelets, look where I was. Like yeah. my brain was blowing up over here. Wow. I think I went up to 600 at a point because uh, I can't see this. Um, red blood cell count going up, hemoglobin. I hadn't seen that in years, brother. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so for me, they, these are the main. These were these are the main metrics. My main uh, metrics because because I had a blood disorder, right? So yeah. that's that's looking every, good. This is like, you're supposed to be cuckoo. And yeah, I was very cuckoo at that time. Yeah, yeah, man. So as you can see there, even if you've got these issues, you can walk it back. It's It takes a bit of time. It just depends on your metabolic syndrome. You know, how many you've got, what, you know, big pharma drugs you might be on. And if you're a younger dude, you know, like you can rev the system back up pretty quickly. But you've got to know the difference between standard labs and functional labs and which ones to get tested. Now, here's one powerful tool to start walking back insulin resistance. The less insulin you make day in, day out, your testosterone will come up, your fat loss will increase, and you're going to start walking back insulin resistance. Now, standard lab between 2.6 and 24.9. Absurd. Functional says between two and five. Now we see it quite frequently, you get to about eight and below, testosterone is coming up nicely, fat loss is great, muscle growth is fantastic. So we're seeing it at about eight and below. But ideally you want it between two and five. Last time I had mine checked, I was three. Now this study here, and they've done this a few times, was done with people with pre-diabetes or insulin resistance and their fasting insulin was about 22. So they weren't classified as needing to go on those diabetes drugs, but they weren't too far away. So what they did, three things, and it, all they did, legends, all they did was change the order in which they ate their food. If you eat your carbohydrates first, then protein and veg, massive spike in glucose here, and a massive spike in insulin there. So not good, right? The next test was protein and veg together, then carbohydrates. So the blue line there, blood glucose, pretty good. Insulin, still too high. Final test, vegetables, which coats the lining with a, a big fibrous mesh, then the protein, then the carbohydrates. You see the green line there, much less insulin. So the less insulin you produce day in, day out, you're gonna start walking back insulin resistance and that is huge. Do you see that? So just changing the order in which you eat your foods, 
can be a long step in the right direction. So what I'm going to cover on the next video are all of these points here. How to eat to your personal carbohydrate threshold, how to really implement fasting, how to optimize sleep, how to lower inflammation, and how to fucking shed off that, that those negative thoughts in your head so you're not producing a lot of cortisol and lowering your testosterone and feeling like shit. So what we've covered today are all those triggers of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. And I've shown you how to start eating your vegetables first, then your protein, then your carbohydrate, and exercise in the morning with sun, and you're a long step in the right direction. So on the next one, we're going to talk about the personal carbohydrate threshold, how to put that together. And we'll also talk about how to make sure you're getting all the nutrients your body needs. And you only need to do this over two to three weeks. And then you use what we use, which is called plate design. Super simple. And that's it there. And I'll walk you through it. So if you like these videos, legends, drop a comment below, share it. If you've got any questions whatsoever, what do you think about the system? What do you think about the advice we've been given? I think it kind of sucks because we've got no clue that the basically, as I've just shown you here, working with the functional doctors, that this, you know, what I've just shown you is the reason why we've got low testosterone. So you've got the chemicals, you've got the food preservatives, the emulsifies, big foods, you've, you've got lack of sunlight, you've got lack of exercise, all of those things, iron overload, sick gut, so on, and, you know, all of those things play in a low testosterone. So it's multifaceted and we can fix this. That's the great news. So see you on the next video.